this is not my talk tonight, this evening, contraception, why not? But I, there's a usual joke, you probably already heard it, but it's still good. Um, and I have to tell it tonight because the mother of one of the young men that features in this talk is here today. And this is that years ago, when I was in California, many years ago, probably 20 some years ago, and uh, I was going to give my talk, and this eight year old young man, who is my godson, uh, told me that when he misses me, he watches my video. He said, I think it's called contractions, why not? <laughs> right? Now he was the oldest of five, so he certainly had never heard of um, contraception, but he knew a lot about contractions. Uh, so a couple years later, I was in Trinidad, and I was asked about a, a national problem in Trinidad. And I was asked if I thought rapists should be castrated. Right? My knees buckled, and I said, gee, I, I <laughs> never given any thought to that. I said, obviously, rape's a terrible crime. It deserves a severe penalty, but that's mutilation. I said, I've heard there's drugs that can be used to control the sexual desire. Maybe that should be explored. So the next day, I'm leaving Trinidad, and I'm buying a new uh, something, and I look down at the national newspaper, and it says, castrate rapists. And the subheading says, drugs can be used to reduce their sex drive, says US professor. <laughs> Again, my knees buckled, and I said, I sure hope there's some other US professor in <laughs> Trinidad this weekend. <laughs> so my talk was all about contraception, but that was the, the headlines. All right, I got another one. Anyway, so this talk is about the good news and the bad news about uh, Humanae Vitae 50 years later. I'm going to tell you another old joke. You probably haven't heard this one. This is when I was teaching at Notre Dame. And uh, e. e. Michael Jones told this joke with some joy. If you recall, Father Richard McBrien, one of the major dissenters, was the uh, chairman of the theology department there. So he told this joke. Again, we were at Notre Dame, and Notre Dame is in the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend. Uh, this uh, putative person made a phone call to Richard McBrien chairman of the theology department, and he said, I have good news and bad news. He says, the good news is that the Pope has declared that women can be ordained priests. And that's something McBrien was really working for, so he'd say, good news. He says, the bad news is that Janet Smith has just been ordained a priest and named Bishop of Fort Wayne, South Bend. <laughs> good news and bad news. All right, the good news about Humanae Vitae. One thing is, we're certainly able to defend Humanae Vitae better than ever. These last 50 years, we've made great strides in developing our, our explanations and arguments about why the church is right about uh, contraception. We have great resources. Uh, there's, these are some books that came out in the last couple years. I'm sure I'm gonna leave some out, so don't get too offended. There were too many, there's too many. How wonderful is that? There's too many good books out there. One is Contraception and Catholicism uh, by Angela Franks. Franks. It's a small book, but extremely good. There's Adam and Eve After the Pill by Mary Eberstadt. Again, a very good review of uh, the sociological data that defends the predictions of uh, Pope Paul VI. Patrick Coffin, who is going to be speaking here. Has he spoken? Will be speaking. Uh, he's got a wonderful little book called The Contraception Deception. There's a book that's coming out, it's not yet out, but it's about by Catholic Answers uh, called Inseparable, Five Perspectives on Sex, Life, and Love in Defense of Humanae Vitae. Uh, Cardinal Burke has a introduction to that. I'm sure it's gonna be a great little, a great little volume. And of course, there's the indispensable, unbelievable Christopher West who has given us so many books. These are just three of them. Uh, Theology of the Body for Beginners, The Love That Satisfies, and At the Heart of the Gospel. He has dozens of books, and he's just absolutely remarkable for what he's done um, for the church. Uh, some people say I should be, maybe I should be jealous of him because he's sold more copies and spoken to more people than I do. And I say, well, you know, Saul had his thousands and David had his tens of thousands. And, that's just fine, all right? Any, anybody that wants to pick up and run with it, I'm happy, and he's done a wonderful job. I've got two books that just, just come out. Um, Self Gift, which is a collection of scholarly articles that I have written on Humanae Vitae and on the thought of John Paul II. And then Why Humanae Vitae is Still Right. <laughs> uh, George Weigel, he wanted to say, I was gonna give him a copy of my book, and he said, I already have a copy. 
And I said, what? And he said, I said, well, I just signed one. I'll give you a signed copy. He said, oh, that book. I said, which book? And he said, the one that says the truth is still true. I said, I didn't write a book that said the truth is still true. But that's what he was thinking of why Humana Vitae is still right. The truth <laughs> is still true, all right? That's, that's a good. Anyway, that's a, 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 a sequel to an earlier volume that we put out with, I put out with Ignatius Press, uh, which was Why Humani Vitae is Right a Reader. And both of these books are collections of essays, uh, most of them already published, on a wide variety of, of approaches uh, to Humani Vitae. 25 years after the first volume, there's all sorts of new angles and again, deeper ways of thinking about these things that this book uh, covers. There's these two new movies out, I can't wait to see them. I, I'm the star in both, no, I have a bit role in both of these, uh, Sexual Revolution and Unprotected. Unprotected will be shown tonight. I can't wait to see it. All right, so that's not, that's just a tip of the iceberg of the resources that we have. But 25 years ago, these did not exist. And again, I could do a whole talk just on resources. Let's go, I'm gonna do a little bit, you're gonna have a little bit of um, philosophy and theology, so hunker down, all right? Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the natural law explanations that are pretty much better than have been offered before, personalist arguments, arguments from scripture, scientific arguments, and social arguments. The best natural law arguments actually come from Carol Wojtyla himself. This morning I, I mentioned his book, Love and Responsibility. And in this book he gives a natural law, philosophical defense of the church's teaching on contraception, on, on, on sexuality. He makes very little reference to scripture. He sneaks it in every now and then. But um, for the most part, this is entirely uh, philosophical. So I'm gonna give you, those of you who haven't studied natural law or maybe not for a long time, there's a few little reminders I'm gonna put before you that natural law is based not on the laws of nature. It's not just that, that the sexual organs have as their natural finality bringing forth a new life but it's based on the essence of things, on the essence of things. Human beings by, are by nature essentially rational, free, and loving creatures. So those are the principles that determine what is right and wrong. Is this act in accord with our rationality, with our freedom, with our loving nature? We need to act in accord with our natures. Everything needs to act in accord with this nature. We're free to do so, we're the only creature that can choose not to act in accord with our nature. But tomato plants have to act like tomato plants. They can't act like dogs <laughs> or lettuce or anything else. We can act like dogs. We can act like couch potatoes. We can do all sorts of things. But we're supposed to act in accord with our nature, which will really be a glorious thing if we did. So a lot of people don't understand. Because of our human nature, marriage is natural. Education is natural and even worship of God is natural. By our very nature, we are meant to be in a relationship um, with God. And in every way, if we do marriage right and we get a good education and we worship the right God, our natures will prosper, much as if you give tomato plants water, sunshine, a good soil, the right temperature, they prosper, right? So there's certain things human beings have to do that are in accord with their nature which will make him prosper, not financially, but in the sense of, of living very satisfying human lives, right? very rich and satisfying human lives. So the natural purpose of the human sexual act is to reproduce, on the one hand, very simply, is to reproduce another member of the species. That in itself, though, is not enough to tell us that contraception is wrong. That's not the church's argument, that the reason we can't contracept is because the purpose of the human sexual act is to, or because the sexual act is to produce another member of the species. That's the purpose of animal sex. Animals are supposed to produce another member of the species. Human beings, it's, it's good that we do. It's good that the human species continues, that's for sure, right? But we treat human beings and animals entirely differently. We have no problem sterilizing, contracepting, killing and eating animals. So if anybody tells you the teaching of the, the church's teaching on uh, contraception is looking at human beings as though that we're animals and that the primary purpose of the sexual act is to produce another member of the species, 
we say, no, if it were, we would have no trouble contracepting human beings, sterilizing them, even killing them and eating them, because that's what we do to animals. So clearly human beings, because we're infinitely different from every other animal on the face of the earth, our acts are to be evaluated in an entirely different way. Um, these actions are not moral for human beings because we're not the same as animals. I, I shouldn't have stuck human in that title, right? Erase that from your mind, delete it, right? Here we get better. The purpose of the human sexual act is to participate in the procreation of another human being or person, not just another member of the species, right? I know that the dog lovers and cat lovers, you know, and giraffe lovers and rodent lovers, I know you all love your little pet, you know, you love them, right? As if they were totally unique and almost another little person. But I hate to tell you, I hate to tell you, they are just another member of the species. They don't have immortal souls. They have souls, they're loving, they're wonderful, but they don't have immortal souls. Only human beings have immortal souls. So when we have sexual intercourse, we're, participate, we're engaging in an act that might help bring forth an immortal soul. That has infinite value, infinite value. A new human soul changes the whole world. Something happens, someone comes into existence that has never existed before, right? And we hope we'll always exist with God in heaven. We'll always exist, one place or the other, right? but we'll always exist. So every new human being actually changes the whole universe because you have something that didn't exist before and will exist forever. That's all of you. That's everybody on the face of the earth. There's billions and billions of them. You say, how can God love billions and billions of people? Sometimes I wonder. I look around and I say, that one? <laughs> that one? You know? <laughs> but, you know, parents love every child. Every child. And with our pathetic little withered little hearts, we can love enormously every one of the children we have to the point where we'd be willing to die for them. I mean, actually, from the moment they enter the world, this is something that blows my mind, that a woman delivers a baby, the husband is there, they've never met this kid before, he's done nothing, he's done nothing, and he's gonna be a lot of work for a lot of time maybe his or her whole life, right? They haven't done a thing for you yet, not even smiled at you yet, nothing, right? And you love them like crazy. The fact if someone came in the room and said, I, I'm gonna kill somebody in this room, either the baby or the mother or the father, both the mother and the father say, me, right? Not my spouse and not my child. You say, the child, you barely know him, he's done nothing, right? but you totally, absolutely love him, right? Or her, right? And you lay down your life for that person. That's an astonishing thing. I suppose some people would lay down their life for their dog or their cat, but they're not thinking right, right? They're not thinking right, <laughs> right? But the person who will lay down their life for a child is absolutely thinking and loving right, right? Because they know the value of this child. Again, if with our little hearts, we can love a new human being with that kind of intensity to sacrifice the most important thing we have, which is our life. You can imagine how God, who is infinitely good, infinitely good, has no witheredness in his being, right? No selfishness, nothing, no limitations. How much he can love every human being. And that he can love billions with the same intensity, much greater intensity, than we can love one. That's an extraordinary thing. Right? So what we're doing is we're helping God, when we engage in an act of sexual intercourse, we're helping God create a new human soul because only God can create an immortal soul. Right? Only God can create an immortal soul. A sperm does not have an immortal soul and an ovum does not have an immortal soul. So when sperm meets ovum, where does that immortal soul come from? Right? And it's not like God has this huge storehouse somewhere of pre-existing souls that he takes one out and pops it into the next human being. He actually does what he does at the beginning of the whole world. He creates. And creating means making something out of nothing. So every one of us has a soul, an immortal soul. 
And that immortal soul uh, was made by God individually, individually. He didn't make it out of pre-existing material. He didn't take some old souls and polish them up or anything and put it back in the human body. He makes a brand new, fresh, beautiful soul. And we get one. Right? So when spouses are engaging in lovemaking, love making, I'm going to speak lovemaking as much as I can instead of having sex. Because what spouses do is they make love. Right? People outside of marriage have sex. But spouses don't have, have sex. They make love, right? So when spouses are making love, especially during the fertile time, they're inviting God to create a new human soul. And they're saying, we will accept this new human being as a great gift from you, right? We understand what an amazing thing it is to be on the receiving end of being able to bring into existence this incredible human being, right? So when a new human person is conceived, God must perform a new creative act. God's involved in individually, individually, in the coming to be of every human being. It would be very wise for each one of us to spend some time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Certainly, the exposed Blessed Sacrament would be best, but in front of a tabernacle. Thank God for that. And then also ask him to show you how valuable you are. All right? And it doesn't matter, believe me, how bad you've ever been. I mean, think if you had it, you know, we all have, everybody has children. We've all been children ourselves, we've been bad. That doesn't make our parents love us less, right? In a certain sense, we love them more, right? They need us more, right? This is my bad little boy or bad little girl. I have to pray for this one a lot, right? I have to get this one around, right? I'm gonna do my best uh, to help this one. Right, so this is a little cartoon I actually got from the Philippines. I know there's some people here from the Philippines. I got this some 25 years ago in the Philippines, which illustrates, again, the sperm doesn't have an immortal soul, the egg doesn't have an immortal soul, but God creates the immortal soul. So how does this fit into our defense of humanae vitae? Again, you're starting to see it. Who would want to block God from creating a new human soul? Who would want to say, we want to engage in this fertile act but we're gonna make it un infertile so that we can have sex on our terms and not on God's terms. God has told people, you can have married people, you can make love all month long. You can make love fertile period, infertile period, go right ahead. But if you're going to make love during the fertile period, I don't wanna be shut out, right? That's the arena that I made where I might create a new human soul. So if you think it's not right to have another child right now, and I hope we've discussed it, God, God and the spouses, we've come to an agreement. It's not a good idea to have another child right now. Well, then you can find your sexual acts to the infertile, period, infertile periods, right? So this is there's another truth that's connected, this, which is conveyed in the first line of Humanae Vitae. I'm starting to get a little obnoxiously militant about saying my translation is better than others. I've been quiet long enough about that, and I think now I'm going to just knuckle down and just say my translation is better than others, right? <laughs> Got it? And you'll quickly agree with me. I expect there's going to be just an outcry, letters to the Vatican asking them to take down the translation they have on their website and telling them they have to put mine up. Most translations you have start with this. God has entrusted to spouses the very serious duty of transmitting human life. Now, how many of you love very serious duties, right? Isn't that largely paying your taxes, you know, <laughs> cleaning the garage, you know? Who likes very serious duties? Like, you want to get them over with so you can go enjoy life, right? Because various ser serious duties are just not pleasant. Well, uh, when I was working on Humanae Vitae initially, honestly, this was part of what got me into doing a lot of the work I've done on it, is I decided to go look at the Latin text because there were other passages I didn't like. And I started, though, at the beginning. I didn't expect to find what I found. And I discovered, I look at the Latin because the Latin is always the official text of the church. And so everything has to go back to the Latin text if you're going to argue about what the text means. And I, the first line was, uh, we never would have translated it uh, like this. The first line 
had, let's go down here, had the words bottom of the page here, guavissimo munis. Now you Latinists, all you Latinists out there, know that gravissimo munis means extremely important gift, right? Extremely important gift. And I was said, well, no classicist, no Latinist would ever translate munis as duty. And wouldn't translate gravissimo as very serious, would say of great weight, of great importance, right? A munis of great importance. And I thought, well, I mean, a Latinist would say gift. That's what munis would mean. A couple other things, too, and I'll tell you that in a moment. So I looked at the Italian, and the Italian word was dovere, and the Latin was seriosum, dovere. And so very serious duty is a very good translation of the Italian. But the Italian is not the official language. Latin is the official language. So I was a classicist. I read classical texts in Latin. But I said, oh, I should go look at church Latin, because maybe it means something different in church Latin. Right? I said, the good place to go, because Humanae Vitae is written right a couple years after the documents of Vatican II. I'll see if the word munis appears in there. And I want to tell you this was before search engines, and it was even, there was not even a concordance yet. So my little eyes went through all the documents of Vatican II in Latin looking for the word munis. Right? I think it appeared some 268 times or something like that. But I didn't have to, I mean, I, I did look at all of them because, I mean, I'm one of those little nerds that when I get to heaven, I want to be in the room that does word studies, right? <laughs> I love that more than just about anything. Just almost just about anything is doing word studies. So I had a great time doing this. And what I found out that the word munis is an extremely important word in Vatican II. Jesus has the threefold munis of being priest, prophet, and king, right? Jesus is meant to be priest, prophet, and king. That's his munis. I thought, well, gift doesn't really work there so well. And I discovered it meant mission. It meant mission, role, task. But task is something like put on a list, and, and um, what did I say? Role is something you play in a, in a, you act in a play. Mission is something that you're, <laughs> I know some of you are thinking about, um, what's that movie? We're on a mission from God, right? Anyway, the Blues Brothers, we're on a mission from God. And everybody's on a mission from God. And that's what munis means, what your mission is. Jesus had the mission of being priest, prophet, and king. Right? The Holy Father has the, well, Mary has the mission, the munis. Oh, I've got them here. Um, Christ has the threefold munis of priest, prophet, and king. Mary has the munis of being the mother to Jesus. That was her mission on earth. The Pope has the munis of infallibility. And popes have the munis, uh, priests, bishops have the munis of teaching the faith. And spouses have the munis of transmitting human life. Wow, all right? It's not a small thing. So let me go back to, my, to this page. My translation, the better translation, says, God has entrusted to spouses the extremely important mission of transmitting human life by which they offer service to God. Those lines are also there. Doesn't that sound beautiful? That's the job of spouses. They certainly are to love each other. One of the, the, one of the munarei, a munis of spouses, is to love each other and affirm each other and make this other person, your spouse, feel like they are just incredibly special, which of course they are. You pour your love on them in a loving, unconditional, permanent, committed way, right? And into that union, you're, what that union can do is bring forth new human life, new human beings, new immortal souls to be with God for an eternity. That's no small munis, right? That's no small munis. So that's one of the arguments for the church's teaching on contraception. You're not fulfilling your munis, right? You're shutting God out of the arena that he created for new human souls to come to be. And here we have Joseph and Mary presenting Jesus in the temple. Again, we're supposed to do our best to give our children back to God to give our children back to God. That's what he wants. 
And that's what the church teaches, and that's why contraception is so bad. It's saying no to God. Don't say no to God, right? Another set of better understandings are in uh, John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Here he provides what are called personalist arguments. And personalist arguments, whereas love and responsibility was providing arguments based on natural law, a natural law is based upon the dignity of the human person who comes about as a result of the human act. Personalist arguments start with the person and how my choices impact me. And when they're really being fully um, true and faithful to my personhood, not to the goodness of the child that is being born, but to am I living up to core to my nature and my goodness? You know, the very heart of the theology of the body, and I highly recommend if you can ever get to the TOB Institute uh, sessions in Philadelphia, it's a week, week long in Philadelphia, Theology of the Body Institute, you will never regret it. You will never regret it. It'll be a week, week of your life that was incredibly well spent. People go there, actually come back year after year. Right? And it's very arduous. Um, you listen to people like me talk for like six hours of the day. Huh. And these people sit there and take it, all right? And they actually love it. That's the odd thing. Um, and they go to mass, and there's confession available. And it's in a place that has, it's in a beautiful, you know, wooded area. You can go for walks, and they have a swimming pool. And sometimes even people bring tennis rackets and play with me. And they have to lose. That's part of the requirement. I have all ways of making that happen. And it doesn't involve hitting winning shots. It involves reducing their part of the court to almost that big that they have to hit to me. And then I get the whole court that I get to hit to. And then if they're really good, they have to carry a bucket of tennis balls and not drop any of them when they're hitting. And then if they're really, really good, they have to do cartwheels between shots. <laughs> and then I win. But anyway, I highly recommend it. Now, if you can't do that, uh, go online and watch as many uh, videos as you can by Christopher West and people teach at the TOB Institute, and you will get a great education without having to pay a lot of money for a flight and going there. It's more fun to go there, I promise you. Anyway, the theology of the body talks about the nuptial meaning of the body, that our very bodies show that we're meant to be in relationship with other people, right? The male with the female and the female with the male. And it actually indicates we can't be complete until in relationship with the other, right? So we have two individuals getting married here. And what this is supposed to indicate is that they are making a complete self-gift of themselves to the other, a complete self-gift. I give myself to you in a way in which I give myself to no other. I'm going to engage in an act with you, which it should be true, I have never engaged with, and I never will engage with, another human being. My sexuality belongs to you, right? And I preserved it for you. Now, most people haven't, of course. Go to confession, tell God you're sorry, right? Get your head right about sexual intercourse. Remember, God made the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk. He can make the impure pure. <laughs> he can do it, but you have to ask him. You have to ask him. So when you go into marriage, you hope to say to this person, again, you and you only. Never been anybody else, and you and you only for the rest of my life. I'm going to make a complete self-gift to myself to you. And that means from here on out, in a certain sense, all my decisions pass through you. Right? I get a kick out of watching spouses. You know, they leave the house and they say, honey, I'm going to Walmart. They're basically asking permission. You know, can I go? Do you need me? Do you need anything at Walmart? They're minions for each other, right? What can I do for you? What can I pick up on the way home? Do you need anything? You don't buy anything, any large amount of money with clearing it with your spouse. You don't plan vacations without planning your spouse. You and your spouse are now approaching the world as two people that have to make decisions together. That's complete self-giving. It doesn't at all mean a doormat. It doesn't mean you have to yield in everything to your spouse, but it means the two of you go forward as one. That's what complete self-giving is. I don't, make, I don't do anything big in my life without making sure that we're on the same page about this because we are going through the world as one instead of two. Now, it means even this nuptial spousal meaning the body 
means even more. Those of us who don't get married, right? Every, or whose spouses dies or spouses leave them or whatever. I met, this is the coronation of Mary, Jesus crowning Mary, Queen of Heaven. Astonishing thing, Queen of Heaven. Of all the great saints and all the great everything, who gets to sit on the throne with Jesus, right? Mary, Queen of Heaven. She's meant to represent many things. First of all, she is herself. She gave herself completely to Jesus. Everything, everything to Jesus, right? That's also meant to be the church. If you read Ephesians 5, it's all about Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And so that represents the church up there. The church is the bride of Christ. And I want you to know that that represents your soul. Mary represents your soul, the souls of everyone, males and females, that you are in a spousal relationship with Jesus. Every human being is that is baptized, right? We're in a spousal relationship with Jesus. I just taught a bunch of young priests. They don't like bridal images for themselves, you know, because they do think of dressing up in a white gown and walking down the aisle. I said, you know, that's not it. That's not what it is. It's being in a very intimate relationship with Jesus. It's allowing him to gaze on you and tell you how much he loves you, and he just loves you because you exist, right? And it has the intimacy of spouses, not the intimacy of parent and child, but the intimacy of spouses. They were having such a hard time with this. Um, they were going through, we were going through all these different images in, in Scripture, you know, that priests are shepherds and priests are this, that, friend of Jesus and all this stuff. And one of them was saying, well, you know, we're also meant to be slaves of Christ. I said, so you're telling me you'd rather be a slave than a spouse? And they actually said yes. That was hilarious. They came in after the break kind of walking in like a, a, some sort of gang, and they said, we'd rather be slaves than spouses. We'd rather be slaves than spouses. It's very hard for the male mind to get around that, right? But it's worth it. It's worth it. And let God do it for you. You don't have to work that hard at it. Again, in prayer, just say, God, it seems crazy to me that my male soul is supposed to be a bride of Christ. But would you tell me what that means? Women don't have nearly the hard time with that. It's, it's a great gift for being a female, is that we slide right into that bridal relationship with Jesus, or we should, right? But males have to ask God to show them what it means. So even if you don't get married, and if you are married, you are supposed to have a spousal relationship with Jesus. Your body shows that you're meant to be in a relationship with the other, with the other, right? So the spousal meaning of the body means that persons are made in the image and likeness of God, that God is a trinity, a communion of persons, a communion of lovers. This is one of John Paul II's huge contributions to our thinking. If you look back at Thomas Aquinas, unbelievable saint. He said we're made in the image and likeness of God, and by that he meant that we were rational and free. But John Paul II says we're not just rational and free, we're lovers, right? And we're meant to be in a communion of lovers. And so we're meant to love and be loved, not just to understand and choose freely. We're meant to love and be loved, and in a certain way our rationality and our free will are in service of our being lovers. Right? Persons are to be a communion of lovers, we're to love and be loved. And again, it's the very makeup of our bodies that shows that we are to be in union with others. Theology of the body also talks about the language of the body. It says that the act of sexual intercourse says something. We do all sorts of things with our body that say something. You, you, you shake people's hands, you give them a hug, you kiss them on the cheek, you punch them in the nose, you kick them in the knee. Right? These mean something, right? I'm, I'm glad to meet you, I'm really fond of you, kiss on the cheek, I'm especially fond of you, I kick you in the knee, punch you in the nose, made me angry, right? That's what it means. What does this mean? It doesn't mean I love you, all right? Now Judas, of course, kissed Jesus and was betraying him, right? He used his body to say a lie, right? A kiss means this is my friend. But he meant it to say, I'm signaling him out for you to kill him. Huge betrayal. Well, John Paul II says, if we don't speak the language that sex speaks when we have our sexual acts, we are lying with our bodies. We're telling a lie with our bodies. So what he says, the act of sexual intercourse says, I find you attractive. 
I want to share a great pleasure with you. It's a beautiful phrase. I'm willing to be a parent with you. You know, we can say to a lot of people, I find you attractive, and I want to share a great pleasure with you. But the list is not long that says, I want, I'm willing to be a parent with you. That's a short list. And it pretty much might reduce down to one. Right? So when you're having an act of sexual intercourse that is open to a child, you're saying to that person, I'm willing to be a parent with you. Again, what does that mean, right? I like your eyes, I like your walk, I like your laugh, I like your values. I wanna have breakfast with you. I wanna to go to PTA. I wanna save for braces and college and weddings. And I wanna grow old with you. That's what that act always means when there's no contraception in it. And we should be very conscious of that. John Paul II says the importance of consciousness that I'm not just saying I want to have this huge pleasure with you, but I'm giving of myself completely to you. I'm saying I'm willing to be a parent with you. That means that I'm all in. I'm in it for the long haul. But those who are contracepting are saying I want a momentary pleasure with you. I just want a momentary pleasure because that's all contraceptive sex is. And that's why people are having contraceptive sex with this one, that one, and that one. There's a wonderful new movie out there. It's, I think it was in the theaters for one day, but you can get it on, I don't know if you can get it on uh, Amazon or Netflix, but one of them for sure, which is called The Dating Project. The Dating Project. It's about a lady professor. It's a true story. It's a documentary even. It's not just a true story. It's a documentary. And this teacher is uh, requiring students to go on a date college students. They've never been on a date. Most of her students have never been on a date. They've done a lot of what they call hooking up, which means having sex. And what leads up to having sex is not a date. It's going to a party, and you're probably drunk before you get there, and you drink some more. And then you meet someone that you make out with, and you find a dark room with a flat surface, and you have sex. And you know nothing about each other. And they were all accustomed to hooking up. But they thought, they thought dating would be hard because you had to talk to the person, all right? You had to be vulnerable. You had to find out how to get to know someone, let someone get to know you. Right? And they, they said, never been, they thought it was an exciting possibility, but they didn't know how to do it. So she gave them guidelines and rules. They could, um, whoever asked the, someone out had to plan the date. and. It, they could only be together for an hour to an hour and a half. They could only spend $10 on the date, which meant they couldn't go to Starbucks, I suppose, um, down to the local dive and uh, get a cup of tea, I suppose. And it's just remarkable what happens in this movie. These kids who had been hooking up, they're terribly nervous about asking someone out. And there's one young man, there's a couple, oh, the moments are so fantastic. He stands there and he's just like saying, you know, I've been looking at this, watching, I've been watching this one girl for three months. He said, she's the one I'm gonna ask out. So the next little thing they show him and he's just like, he's beaming like, I did it. He said, that was even better than hooking up. <laughs> all right? That's, and he hadn't even been on the date yet, all right? And, and he just, that manly thing of picking out a woman and having the courage to go over and ask her out and then getting the yes. I mean, he had never experienced that before, right? Another man is, a young man, 18, he hasn't been doing much hooking up because he, his friends are kind of pers pushing him to do it. And he says, it just doesn't seem right, right? And he finds a girl and he says, I, I, I figured it, he shows him getting dressed up and everything and not too dressed up, but just making sure everything's just right. And, he says, I, I knew where she was working and I knew when she was off of work and I got there and the, the guards were closing the doors and he, he said to them, please let me get in just for a minute. I wanna ask this girl on a date. And they said, which one? And she said, that one over there. Said, oh yeah, she's a nice one. And he asked her out and afterwards he's just flying, flying. You know, he had a real conversation with the girl, right? And she enjoyed it and he enjoyed it, just incredible. And then there's another man who's older, he's in his 40s. A very handsome man, very witty, just adorable, right? But what he said, he said, I've spent my whole life womanizing. So I've basically had the women I want. 
He said, but I'm sick of myself. He said, I am just a storefront. He said, there's nothing behind me. He said, I come off. Very impressive. He said, but nothing behind me. He said, I don't have anything to give. He said, I don't know how to be a commitment. I just want people to satisfy my desires. I don't know how to give. I don't know how to be a person. Right? And he's working hard at it, working hard at it. And then he shows a little, present, a little sit, sitting with his mother. He's like the youngest of seven or 10 or something. And she's Catholic, you know, and she's 90 something. And they're sitting there just snuggling with each other. And she says, well, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. I knew someday you'd come around. You know, so anyway, much worth watching. But he's working hard at being a person, all right, and knowing how to be self-giving. So when you say I'm willing to be a parent with a person, you're saying I want a total lifetime commitment with you. I want to make a complete gift of myself to you. Again, this is the huge difference between saying I want to have sex with you, which is a very sensuous, one-time, anonymous act, and that's what contraception basically says, even if you're having it in a committed relationship, this act that's contracepted can't convey the meaning of lifetime commitment. But saying to a person, I want you to be the mother or father of my children, I said, if anybody says that to you, fall over. That's a marriage proposal, right? Most incredible thing that can be done. We also have a better understanding of the scripture-based arguments. There's a great article in that new book, Why the Truth is Still True, um, or why humani vitae is still true, because God's an abundant God in scripture, right? He promises empires more numerous than sands on the seashore and stars in the sky. This God has great plans, right? He chooses a little tribe of Israel, but he intends to spread the whole world. Abraham, oh my gosh, we're all offspring of Abraham. Fertility in scripture is a blessing, and infertility is a curse. And then God supplies for our needs in miraculous ways. And you know, we worry, we worry. And God tells us, don't worry, don't worry. I can multiply loaves and fishes. I met a woman who, a black woman from Baltimore, she had 15 children in her family. Um, and she said she was the one in charge of getting the food from the freezer in the basement at night. It was an amazing thing. Her mother fed all of the children before her, the father came home. And then they had a candle lit dinner every night after the kids were fed and off, and then they just have dinner together by candlelight. But what she found was she'd go down and bring up tonight's dinner, and they'd have dinner, and she'd go down the next night, and there wasn't reduced at all. Got that night's dinner, took it upstairs, went back down. Freezer's still as full as it was before. She said, this could go on for a very long time. When we were stretched for money, the freezer didn't get lowered down. Somehow, God kept supplying the food night after night uh, for that family. Scientific evidence, I'm not gonna go through that, but there's a foolishness uh, of, we've discovered where there's a foolishness of messing with our hormones. There's a link with cancer and other lethal conditions. There's sociological evidence, again, of the disaster for our culture of abortion and single parenthood. Now we have um, population problems in developed countries because there's not enough children and countries are giving incentives to couples to have children. You know, I said, people don't need incentives to have children. People love having children, right? It helps to have a uh, stay, uh, you know, so, some time afterward for taking care of yourself and the baby. But we don't know we love children anymore. People discover this after they've had children. But years ago, I mean, my, my parents' generation, to some extent mine, we had big families, we had babies. And if you had a baby in the house, you knew you wanted a baby in the house, right? You knew you wanted to get, my, my father's generation was basically, from the time they were little boys, they wanted to be men, right? They wanted to be men, and they knew what that meant. That meant I have to get a job, because if I get a job, I can get the girl. And if I get the girl, I can get married. And if I get married, I get the house. If I get the house, I get the kids. And then I become a pillar of the community. I, uh, at the J I'm, at this, I'm at the Kiwanis, and I'm at this, and I'm at that. And now I'm a real man, because that's who a real man is. He gets a job, and he gets the girl, and he gets the house, and he gets the kids, and he becomes a pillar of the community. That's what a man is, and that they don't want that. Now, what do, men, what do boys want? Well, they got so many fun games now, they want more games. They want more toys. They're perfectly happy sitting in their mother's basement until they're in their 30s just playing computer, computer games. Right? And if they should be lucky enough ever to get married and have a baby, 
believe me, the minute that baby is born, they look at life entirely differently. It's, I even I read of one man who, after his first baby, he was 35. On the way home, he stopped by a padlock for his video cabinet. This was before DVDs and computers. And why was he doing that? He had videos in this that he knew his child should not watch. The baby's only a couple hours old. But he's taken precautions. He's changed entirely. And by the time that child is, is able to watch anything, those are not going to be in the house. Right? Because he had changed entirely by that time. And what made him change? That baby who he loved. And he wants to be a good father too. So everything changes. There's this interesting book out now called Estro Generation uh, that explains how estro estrogenics are making you fat, sick, and infertile, right? We're beginning to discover how absolutely horrible these are, these hormones are that women are putting in their bodies day after day, month after month, year after year. Other good news, oh, this is great. The Philippine bishops in 1990 apologized for not having taught the church's teaching on contraception. I find this so moving every time I just wanna, I just wanna cheer, okay? They said in a document called Love is Life, it is said that when seeking ways of regulating births, only 5% of you consult God, meaning don't use contraception. In the face of this unfortunate fact, we, your pastors, have been remiss. How few are there among you whom we have reached? There have been some couples eager to share their expertise and values on birth regulation with others. They did not receive adequate support from their priests. We did not give them due attention, believing then this ministry consisted merely of imparting a technique best left to married couples. This is one of my favorite lines written ever. Only recently have we discovered how deep your yearning is for God to be present in your married lives. The bishops are saying, as Weigel said earlier, we thought you wanted Catholic light. We thought you wanted Catholic light, right? We didn't know you were up to the challenge. We didn't know you had this deep desire to say, you know, I want to do what Jesus says. I, I want to say, Jesus, if you say it, I want to do it. I love you. I want my whole life to be permeated. I'm not one of those that says the church has nothing to say what's in my bed, what I do in my bedroom. I want to say I want God in every part of my life, right? Because God's will is always better than my will, always. So if you can tell me what God's will is, let me know. <laughs> I know that's the sure path to happiness and salvation. But the bishops go on. We did not know then how to help you discover God's presence and activity in your mission of Catholic parenting. Afflicted with doubts about alternatives to contraceptive technology, we abandon you to your confused and lonely consciences. Make up your own mind about it. Act in accord with your conscience. With a lame excuse, we said follow what your conscience tells you. How little we realized that it was our consciences that needed to be formed first. A greater concern for you would have led us to discover that religious hunger in you. How beautiful is that? Bishops being contrite because they hadn't done their job, right? A lot of us don't do our jobs, right? Believe me, the bishops aren't the only ones who need to hang their heads every once in a while because they haven't been good, good uh, leaders. Uh, we're supposed to be spreading the good news. I honestly don't know when I've ever sat down to someone and tried to convince them to be a Christian and a Catholic. I spend my life in apostolic things like this, but believe me, when I get on a, a plane, I want to send out signals. Don't talk to me. Do not talk to me. I have a book to read. I have work to do. It, it'll be the day that um, I'll be making real strides and becoming a good Catholic is when I say, all right, God, I'm going to get on this flight. It's going to be a two-hour, three-hour flight. And I will let the person next to me talk to me. <laughs> right? And if you want me to talk about God, I will talk about God. I will do that. I don't want to do that. Right? People do that. When I remember Sister Sarah, I forget her last name. She's in Ann Arbor and fantastic. 
She said one day she was totally exhausted and she just wanted to get on the plane and just, you know, zone out. And she did say that because she, she's holy, you know, she said, okay, God, but if you want me to evangelize, let me evangelize. She got on the plane and within, the plane gets off and the guy next to her says something to her. What do you do? Well, I'm a nun and I do this. Well, I have a couple questions about Catholicism. And she said before long, about you know, three seats in front of her and three seats in back of her, there was this little seminar that she was doing <laughs> on Catholicism. I fear that myself. All right, so at any rate, good news, good news. The US bishops, unbelievable. Um, fought the HHS mandate. A hundred percent of the bishops uh, signed on to fight uh, legislation that said that all Catholic employers should pay for contraceptives. Unbelievable. You can be sure a hundred percent do not accept the church's teaching on contraception. But they did their pastorly duty of lining up with the other bishops and fought it and we're winning, all right, we're winning. Who, who are we winning because of the little sisters of the poor? I said, they weren't paying for contraception, right? And so they take it to the Supreme Court and we're getting it overturned, unbelievable. In this 25th, 50th year anniversary of Humanae Vitae, many of the bishops are uh, making statements. Uh, Bishop Aquila uh, put out a beautiful 25 page document, beautiful, beautifully illustrated, beautifully written called The Splendor of Love. Been, we've been greatly blessed at this conference with the beautiful presence of Archbishop Cordelone. I don't know anybody who's any bishop in the United States that is speaking as much this year on this topic as Archbishop Cordelone from many different angles. I didn't go to his talk yesterday morning. I was kind of sheepish about it and I said, you know, I said, I think I probably heard it. Uh, it's probably the same one you gave at Benedictine. He said, oh no, completely different talk. Whew. And then today I saw him. I hadn't been to his talk. I said, it was the same one you gave yesterday? He said, no, completely different talk, <laughs> right? I have, I have a lot of talks, but I also have about 40 different titles for the same talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we should be rejoicing that the seminaries have been reformed. Every seminary is better than it was 15 years ago, every seminary. And some of them are absolutely, yes, go seminaries. <laughs> go seminaries. It's an extraordinary thing. And I always want, some people say I, I sound pessimistic. I mean, you know, the world is going to hell in a handbag. It's, there's no question about it. It's bad and it's going to get worse. That's all I want to tell you. But anybody who teaches in a seminary has to be optimistic. It's not possible if anybody is pessimistic who teaches in a seminary, they don't have eyes to see. We are getting such splendid young men. They come to us splendid, right? They come to us. We don't make them splendid. They come splendid. The parents are doing something incredible. Homeschooling, good colleges, all sorts of things. We're getting tremendous young men. And I've seen them now being ordained. And the homilies they give knock your shoes off, right? It's not the old God loves you, blah, 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 right? <laughs> all right. Also, the Catholic colleges and universities uh, have been reformed. Um, there's new ones, but this is Benedictine College. It used to be kind of a nothing place, and now it is hopping with Catholic activity. It's in a fantastic school. They had a conference on Humanae Vitae a couple months ago. That's the first time I heard Cordeloni's speech that he just gives over and over again. And um, uh, they had work, they had what they call, what do you call them? breakout sessions. They had 60, 60 uh, people speaking at these breakout sessions. Everybody got about 20 minutes, a half an hour. It's incredible, simultaneous, of course. But the, they were all young people. They were graduate students. They were young professors. They were people working in youth group ministry and that sort of thing, giving these beautiful talks about why Humanae Vitae was right, 60 of them. I mean, I, I used a hashtag for some time afterwards as I can die happy, right? I can die happy. There's this whole army out there. People who are ready to give great talks on Humanae Vitae. Of course, there are the great NFP groups. I hope I didn't offend anybody about putting them up there. I should have put California up here. Who else should be there? All right, <laughs> there's this great, great website called Natural Womanhood, Know Your Body, all about NFP. It's a great website for information. Amazing study done by the great, a lot of you don't know Mary Hassan, but she's an awesome lady. 
and she did this uh, study called What Catholic Women Think About Faith, Conscience, and Contraception. She and a, uh, a team of workers called up about 1,500 uh, Catholic women and spent a long time, I think 45 minutes to an hour on the phone with them and asked their views about different things. And this is just part of the information. It says, highlights from the groundbreaking research include the findings that while only 13% of church-going Catholic women completely accept the church's teachings on family planning, 13%, I, honestly, I thought that was high, right? I thought that'd be high. But it goes on to say, acceptance doubles to 27% among young women 18 to 34 who attend mass weekly. That's the cohort that you would think would be contracepting, 18 to 34 year olds. They go to mass weekly and 27% of them accept the church's teaching. It climbs still higher to 37% among women who both attend mass weekly and have been to confession within the past year. That is unbelievable good news, right? Somebody is getting to those young women. Their parents, their youth groups, their parishes, their, the movements that they're a part of, the retreats that they go on, it's unbelievable. Even in the New York Times, there's been a whole series about how bad contraception is. This young woman tried virtually every one of them and said how horrible they were for them. A whole set of videos on this on the New York Times webpage. We're going to be watching a movie tonight, but there's this, this book about, out by this woman named Holly Craig Spall called Sweetening the Pill. And she took contraception for 20 years, and it did terrible things to her body. She has Ricky Lake working with her to bring out a, a, a film about the dangers of contraception. All right, I have to speed a little bit through these things, but because you want to know some of the bad news, right? There's new concerns, AKA the bad news. If you're following it, bad things are going on, uh, largely coming out of Rome, right? There's, these are just headlines. New Academy for Life member uses Amoris Laetitia to say some circumstances require contraception. Right, require. This is a, a priest who serves on the Academy for Life, right? And he's telling people that some circumstances require contraception. Another, another, another member of the Pontifical Academy for Life says that the term intrinsically evil is too restricting, doesn't give us enough wiggle room in regard to contraception. Another cardinal says Amoris Laetitia represents a new paradigm, spirit, and approach. There's a book written, this is an Italian, it, Amoris Laetitia, a point of development for moral theology. Now I'm not saying they're reading Amoris Laetitia correctly, but they are using it to say that uh, contraception, the, the, the prohibition of contraception is an ideal. It's an ideal. And a lot of people can't make that ideal. So they just need to do the best that they can. And I say, is that also true for adulterers and rapists? and thieves. You might want to steal a million, but you know, just steal 900,000 this time and we'll work on it. Gradually, we'll chip that down a little bit, all right? I love this one. Irish theologian criticizes US bishops for making humane vitae into a fetish. That's the reputation of the US bishops now around the world, that they're gung-ho about humane vitae, right? That's, I hope that's true. But it's clearly being a fetish, they say in Ireland about U.S. bishops, but hold on to this. Hold on to your hope. Always put your hope in God. I mentioned in my talk earlier today, I think this new McCarrick situation with Cardinal McCarrick having abused so many seminarians for so many years and so many people knowing about it and doing nothing about it, and more and more reports are surfacing about sexual abuse in seminaries, not in the last couple of years is my bet, but in the past, and sexual abuse of priests among other priests. It's gonna be a rocky time. We're in for a rocky time. And some people are gonna lose their faith just as they lost their faith with the sex abuse crisis. We can't let it happen to us and we can't let it happen to others. We need to do the best we can to say, again, this is, this is God's church. It's the bride of Christ. Human beings are very frail and we do many bad things, and the bishops have done bad things. We've got a lot of good bishops now, and we have to make certain we don't put them all into the same bucket. There's a lot of good bishops. But there's a lot of bad things that happened in the past that need to come to light to get cleaned up. 
Don't lose your faith, all right? Good news is a Monsignor Molina in Rome who's been pushing very hard to explain why a paradigm shift in Humanae Vitae doesn't change its meaning. He says applying a paradigm shift to Humanae Vitae would distort its meaning. And if you want a hero for our times, I choose Cardinal Muller. He was in charge of the CDF at one time and he got booted because he was just too orthodox. Right? And he has not stopped since he got booted. He could have gone back to Germany and just enjoyed being a cardinal there and doing his work. But he stayed in Rome fighting the good fight. He's sort of the man with his thumb in the dike. Uh, he writes a lot for First Things. He writes a lot for Catholic World Report. I think he has a new book out um, with Ignatius Press. But if you're looking for a hero, I nominate Cardinal Muller. Not There are many, of course. And remember this. We're, we are to, we're told in scripture, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, All right? We're gonna, we've been in bad times. Believe me, bad times are coming. There's gonna be a huge amount of dissent in the next couple months coming out of Rome, and they're just gonna be talking about contraception, the church is teaching as an ideal, but permitting spouses and other people to use it, because, and they know, I mean, why do they care about contraception? What do they care about? What do they care about humanity? Do they think it's a dead letter? I mean, they think there's no point in it because 98% of Catholics contracept anyway. But believe me, if you topple contraception, then again, it's gonna permit homosexual relationships, divorce, all sorts of things that they want. So they're still fighting the battle against contraception because they know that the, that is, the teaching on contraception is based on the church's understanding of the human person and of human sexuality. And if you, if you change its teaching on contraception, Virtually everything explodes, right? But don't despair again. God is with us, right? The church is his bride. He loves his bride, right? We have to be that faithful bride. We have to be the ones. There are times in history where it's the, the, the lay people who have kept the faith going. It's the lay people. We can't abandon the church. The church needs us. We've actually been the one that's led the fight to support Humanae Vitae over the last 50 years. It's been the laity, right? It's been the natural family planning groups, right? It's been some theologians, some philosophers, laity, who have led the fight. So I thank those of you who have done it, and I ask of those who are new to this to hunker down and push, you know, lean in. All right, thank you.